Uh, my name is Chris Ariza. I'm coming to you today from MIT, where I'm in the Department of Music and Theater Arts. Um, I have been interested in the Znaka Siv for a long time. It's something that I, like many of you, probably stumbled upon in formalized music and uh, had a lot of questions about. And it led me to investigate the Znaka Siv over a number of years um, and integrate it not only into uh, my software designs, but also into my compositional procedures. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, all of these things um, as we look at this today. So um, there's been many approaches to sieving data or filtering data in various ways um, in many music systems and in other systems. The Zanaka sieve is a little bit more specific. Um, and it's partly more specific because of its use of a notation. It seems that Zanakis really was interested in the ability to use a notation to describe these very interesting uh, periodic integer sequences. Um, Zanakis described or mentioned the sieves in a number of articles from 1965 to 1990, um, and he demonstrated their application for both pitch and rhythm sequences. He also suggested their application to many other musical parameters, and in fact, uh, the sieve is very general and can be applied very broadly. Um, it seems to me that Zanakis thought of the sieve as a very important and sort of fundamental musical structure. He wrote, the basic problem for the originator of computer music is how to distribute points on a line. He wrote, the image of a line with points on it, which is close to the musician and to the tradition of music, is very useful. Um, so it seems to me that Zanakis thought of the sieve as a very fundamental tool. And in fact, of all of his procedures and approaches to organizing musical structures, the sieve, in many ways, is one of the most compact, portable, and, and uh, how to, how to, distributable of, of his ideas, which I think makes it very powerful and very useful for uh, not only musicians, but people in other fields uh, interested in these sort of generative approaches. Now, to review, the basic uh, components of a sieve are pretty simple. We start with a residual class. A residual class is simply a modulus, a repeated uh, cycle, offset by a shift. Um, so for instance, if we have the residual class 2 at 0, it generates an infinite number sequence uh, for a segment of which would go to 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. If we have the residual class 2 at 1, we would have the sequence 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Of course, 2 at 2, the modulus of 2 brings us back to 0, and we only have two unique sequences for the, mod the residual class uh, starting with 2. We can have a residual class at 3, and as you might expect, we have the sequence 0, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. Now, sieves are made by combining residual classes with logical operators. Um, and the most obvious logical operators to use are the uh, union or or operator, which if we were to merge the sequence of 3 at 0 and 4 at 0, we get the uh, 0, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9, 12 sequence, which some of you might recognize as, recognize as a uh, 3 over 4 polyrhythm. Um, or the intersection of two sequences, 3 at 0 and 4 at 0. Um, this combination of intersection and uh, union uh, allows us to produce very complex sieves. And Zanakis, as uh, was sometimes his motivation, pursued this complexity to a great degree. For example, here is his sieve for the major scale, which successfully creates the major scale uh, infinitely in both directions. We can use a smaller sieve to do this in a local or space, but uh, this is a nice approach. Notice the nested groups of sieves that are first combined here and then combined at the larger level. Now, as I mentioned previously, the notation of the sieve seems particularly uh, important to Zanakis. He uh, uh, tried a number of different uh, notations in his writings over the 30 or so years that he uh, talked about the sieve. Um, for instance, he tried describing these residual classes with this uh, subscript n plus 1, where the modulus is given by the large number, the shift is given by the subscript, the n implies a transposition that you're going to enter into the system, um, and then we have uh, the various logical operators available as these symbols. Um, he tried notating the modulus and the shift with commas, as we can see right here, um, and uh, he replaced the logical symbols with the uh, asterisk and the addition sign for his 
preliminary computer implementation, uh, which was published in Formalized Music, uh, the later editions. Now, I've already been showing you the new notation that I developed for implementing and writing sieves. The notation that I use uses the at symbol because, well, it's just the round and nobody knows what to do with it. So it seems like a good use of the at symbol, plus it doesn't use a comma, which if we're parsing these strings, having a comma in there uh, in a list of arguments or otherwise can get uh, annoying. I use uh, these logical operator symbols, um, and so we can create very compact sieve strings that are easily transmittable, easily parsable, and uh, can work in a lot of different contexts. So um, this is a notation I've been using and have thoroughly implemented, and I think one that solves a lot of problems with the other notations that are out there. Now, in 2005, er, I published an article describing my uh, object-oriented implementation of the Zanaka sieve. Um, this is a complete implementation in that it can handle the most complex nested sieves you can think of, or uh, very uh, simple and easy to use sieves. Um, this is released as a simple uh, Python module that can be used in a variety of ways. So if I want to create a sieve, I simply provide a string for the uh, sieve. And if I want the one I just used, three at four, and uh, that's not what I wanted to see. Do three at one and four at two. Uh, I create an object. I can print that object. I can call that object to get some values from it. And I can stick uh, a shift or a different range of values into that sieve to get out sieved values from that. Uh, structure. Uh, if I can grab the infamous major scale sieve here and create another one, you'll see that this works. And here we have A. We can call, we can find the period of this sieve, which as we might expect for the major scale is 12. Um, sieves have this interesting property where they, they can be compressed so we can compress this sieve to represent it as solely the union of residual classes. And in fact, every sieve can be represented as the union of residual classes. So while Zanakis' formulation is uh, brilliant in its uh, complexity, uh, we can represent the same sieve with this simpler uh, union of residual classes. Uh, we can also uh, expand this and go back to our previous version if we want. Uh, I provide a number of different representations of the sieve which are useful for doing different things with these structures. And we, so when we start generalizing the sieve, we can think of it not as a, or a sequence of integers, we can think of it as a sequence of spacings. And I think when we think of the sieve that way, we can do things like, well, generate patterns on windows, which maybe sieve generated or uh, generate patterns of rhythms or pitches or parameters for synthesis operations or anything else. So we can look at a width sieve segment where we take the width of individual uh, active points between a sieve. We can take a binary representation of the sieve which simply gives us which points are active or not and we can take a unit interval spacing of a segment of a sieve which takes the active points within the sieve, maps them within the unit interval, and gives us nice floating point values, which is kind of ironic because it's integer sequences. But this gives us something that we can scale to anything we want whenever we need to. Um, and of course, we can translate these values into pitches if we need, um, simply by doing some basic operations. Uh, so let's see if this works. There we go. Um, so we can translate these values to pitches. And of course, this will work for any sieve string we want to give. Now, uh, for a number of years, I've been working on a, a composition, algorithmic composition tool called Athena CL. This is a Python-based composition tool um, that works at the command line. It can be scripted and parts of it can be used in various other things. Um, you can use it as a sort of Python extension library if you need. Um, 
As part of the system, I've been including and developing a library of algorithmic procedures, generative techniques at both the level of generating parameter values and at the level of, of sort of mac macro musical structures that I call textures. Um, within this system, I have a way of storing and deploying reusable pitch collections, which I call paths. And I've implemented sieves as one of many ways of specifying pitch collections and paths. And in fact, I see sieves as a way of specifying pitch structures that should be included along with scales, uh, fort set classes, or pitch class sets. And in fact, that is what I have implemented in my own software system. Now, sieves, uh, paths within Athena CL can be deployed by textures in a variety of ways and provide a way for textures to share the same pitch material uh, simultaneously. So when we're using Athena CL, we can create a path by entering the path instance new command. We need to give it a name, and it gives us a number of options to enter various parameters. So if I want to enter a sieve, all I have to do is enter the logical string for it. And uh, let's see, let's do this one because it's cool. And there it gives us a sieve. Now you should probably ask, well, how did it determine what the minimum and maximum range was? Well, we can set all that, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, OK, so we'll take that sieve. Do we want another? Uh, OK, and let's say for this one, I'm going to specify 4 at 1 or 9 at 3. And I want it to go from C1 to, I don't know, let's be crazy, go to C9. And let's make the origin point C1, that's where the zero position is. And let's make the ELD, or that's what Zanakis called it, the sort of unit spacing for this sieve 0.5, which is a quarter tone. And there's our sieve <laughs> structure, quite large. Uh, this uses my novel representation for the quarter sharp. Uh, let's accept this, and we're done. We can view our path, and you can see our giant microtonal sieve there next to our uh, more conventional sieve. Now, in Athena CL, all commands can be scripted and run either interactively or from the command line. So for instance, if I wanted to create another sieve, I could simply provide this single string right here, which will generate for me two microtonal sieves uh, with one command. And I can view this and see the structure represented there. Now, uh, for those of you potentially using a Python package that you might want to generate some sieves from, uh, you can simply uh, use this sieve pitch uh, class, which will, let me get out of Athena here and back into Python. Uh, this sieve pitch object provides you the same type of arguments that I just used in Athena. So this is a quick and easy way to generate pitch collections over a range. And I didn't import my module. And here we go. So if I just call this, I get uh, the spacing of that sieve. And this uses a sort of novel pitch representation where zero is middle C, but that can be translated however you need. Um, of course, we can run Athena CL from Py within Python as well by simply creating a Athena CL interpreter object, which I'm calling ATH here. And we can send the ATH object a number of commands. So here, I can create a path remotely uh, within Athena CL. And if I want to just audition that path just briefly, I can uh, throw up a MIDI file and get a little representation of that synth. Now, my focus of my talk for today was looking at the pitch sieves, the opportunity of pitch sieves to be used to create uh, very large scales that do not repeat at the octave. Um, when we map the sieve to pitch space, we get cycles of intervals. And if we create our sieve in the right fashion, we can create what I think are very interesting uh, multi-octave pitch structures that do not repeat um, until, well, the period of the sieve. And compositionally, creatively, I find this a very interesting musical structure. 
because it gets us out of thinking in terms of the pitch class reduction or set class reductionisms. It lets us create registrally distinct pitch collections that still maintain interval coherency, which I think is a very desirable state. Um, Zanakis uh, said something to this point, and I actually just saw this on one of the posters out there, where he describes the beginning of Zanakai deals with pitch sieves in a new way and uses a special non-octaviating scale. Now I think what he means by non-octaviating is exactly what I'm talking about, this, this use of sieves that do not repeat at the octave. So in order to view these sieves, it's helpful to notate them. And so to do this, what I've done is I've created diagrams that look like this. What these do are take a sieve structure over six octaves and uh, transpose them all to the same level so that we can see and easily compare them. I've labeled them with the initial pitch using uh, the register so we can see that this is C1, C2, C3, D4, C5, D6. I've provided a pitch class representation and I've provided a set class notation just so we can keep in mind what we're dealing with. Um, as a side note, I generated these uh, notation examples using both Athena CL and another project I'm working on over at MIT called Music 21, which is a, a symbolic music representation and, and processing uh, toolkit for Python, which makes it very easy for us to automatically generate notation examples like this, which, as you might imagine, is pretty desirable. Um, so how do we avoid octave redundancy in our sieves? Well, Zanakis gives us a few examples. Um, one from Nomos Alpha uh, uses the following sieve, which in traditional fashion is quite complex, partly due to these doubly nested groups. My sieve implementation can process this, and if you're comfortable working in this sort of notation, no problem. Uh, a little bit easier way to look at this sieve is to look at the compressed form, simply the union of basic residual classes, and we see right off from the start a number of 13s, 26, 31. We see a lot of high numbers. The use of those high modulus values are a clue to getting these more interesting sieves. If we represent Zanakis' sieve for Nomos Alpha within a quarter tone step size, we get the following scale over six octaves. Um, and we can see that although there are a few common tones in a few cases between adjacent octaves, we have a lot of interesting distinctions. Uh, I know I saw, like for instance, we have the same E in these two octaves, and we have uh, this, a G common between these two octaves. If we take this nomos alpha uh, sieve and use the half step as our fundamental interval, we get a more spaced out structure. And we can see again that we create a very interesting distribution of pitches in register. Of course, there are interval relationships that are maintained over the large scale. But uh, locally, we have a lot of distinctions, both in terms of the pitches that are used in terms of the resulting set classes um, and other attributes. Now, Zanakis' homage to Ravel, uh, we have this very large uh, sieve here, which, uh, as you can see, is quite complex. Uh, the compressed form of this sieve is a little bit more simple, but equally complex. If we look at this over six octaves, again, we see uh, very interesting, distinct shapes. We do see some more common tones. Uh, notice the E and the D shared here. Uh, but again, we can see that we're able to create some pretty interesting, unique structures, scale structures, over six octaves, which is a really interesting compositional material to work with. Now, if we use simple sieves with uh, low periods, low common multiples, we get repeating structures. So for instance, the union of three and four at the same shift value gives us the same repeating pitch classes and set class for each octave register. Um, if we throw in some uh, different numbers, another residual class into our sieve, we increase the size of our period, and we start to get some more interesting large-scale pitch structures. In this case, the, we can see the periodicity of the 3 and 5 modulus as the repeated uh, 035, 0369 structure that shows up in each of these octaves. 
but the introduction of the seven modulus uh, throws in some changing values in each of these registers. Now, I like to take the easiest approach to creating these interesting pitch structures, and one of the easiest approaches is simply taking values just offset of multiples of the octave. So 11 or 13, uh, 23 or 25, 35 or 37 are an interesting way to guarantee that we're going to get non-octave repeating scales. So for example, this union of 11 at 0 and 13 at 0 uh, gives us a very succinct presentation of the aggregate over uh, six octaves. Uh, we see that each dyad moves closer and closer together and we spell out all 12 tones over the course of six octaves. Um, just for experimentation, this sieve was one that I was experimenting with uh, using 11 and 13 modulus bases and 23 and 25. And here we see the distribution of pitches in each octave is less regular. We have four, three uh, pitch collections and then finally one pitch and notice that we almost complete the aggregate before we get to new pitches, although we do have uh, the introduction of the five here before uh, the, uh, we get the three or one of these. Now, uh, what can we do to actually hear these uh, pitch structures? Well, uh, just for this presentation today, I'm going to show you two different ways of thinking about this. One, I'm going to show you some textural deployments generated from Athenasia, which gives us a way to hear what these scales sound like over the range of the six octaves that I'm looking at. Um, I'm also going to show you later on, if we have time, a little compositional example from a work of my own that uses these structures. So for our first textual deployment, we're going to simply listen to each sieve in its own octave register. Uh, I should say that the partitioning into octaves is fairly arbitrary, but this gives us a nice way to hear each segment of the sieve one at a time. I'm going to create linear monophonic voices. I'm going to use a uh, breakpoint segment to specify durations that move between uh, 10 milliseconds and 120 milliseconds, and I'm going to vary amplitude values with a beta distribution. Um, all uh, approaches to generating parameters that I uh, imagine Zanakis would find uh, potentially interesting. Um, I can automate the production of these textures by uh, creating an Athena interpreter and sending the various commands to the interpreter. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but I'll give you a little sample of what this texture sounds like right here. We'll go back to that in a second. Um, another way of representing the sieve is to sweep across the large six octave structure. And for that, I'm using a texture module called Harmonic Assembly that allows me to specify which uh, pitch within this very large uh, pitch collection I want to draw. And to draw those values, I'm simply using masked random values, which uh, Robert nicely introduced uh, Koenig's tendency mask. This essentially is a tendency mask, and I'm using that to select pitches from the sieve. So we're gradually moving up the pitch scale uh, with this sweep. For this representation, I use a, a FM, basic FM synthesis instrument, but I use it in a legato mode, which gives us some nice sort of melodic uh, structures. Let's listen to just a little bit of this. And in this time domain view, we can see that now, instead of being partitioned into individual octave groups, now our uh, combination of pitches is blurred and overlapping. Um, finally, I collect these pitches into chords as another way of presenting this six octave range of pitches. I collect these pitches into chords and uh, randomly select two or three note chords and generate some rhythms using uh, some weighted randomness. We can hear a little bit about what that sounds like here. Okay, so let's listen to what these sound like. Uh, we're going to listen to three different sieves um, and we're going to listen to them in the three different presentations. We'll start with the Nomos Alpha sieve, and here I did move this to the semitone uh, ELD. We can do this in microtones, but I'll save that for another extended discussion on microtonal sieves. Um, first, we hear the sieve presented uh, where each 
register is isolated by octave. So again, I think we're able to achieve a sort of intervallic coherency while maintaining these uh, local distinctions by register. Here is the legato linear presentation of the same sieve. And finally, the corded presentation of the same sieve. Now, um, this time domain presentation, the piano roll style of view here, uh, has its limitations, but we can clearly see the patterns that are deployed on this large view of six octaves. And again, they should remind us of many sort of spacings and patterns we've seen in other structures of Xenakis. Uh, let's listen to a little bit of the AR sieve, which again is uh, here. Uh, this one, uh, well, let's just hear. and the legato presentation. And for a last example, uh, I'll skip ahead. This last sieve, which uses these very broad spacings, let's listen to this one, because this one is a little bit different than the other two, and we can actually visually see that right here. Uh, let's start with the legato presentation. and a corded presentation of the same. Um, again, hopefully you hear this sort of intervallic coherency that is available from this use of these pitch collections, but again, being able to localize these in registers, I think, offers a very interesting uh, compositional opportunities. Um, for the sake of time, I won't describe uh, my use of this in some of my own compositions, but
but simply um, close by saying that with the sieve we can generate some very interesting and novel, not pitch class, but actually pitch space structures and offer a really valuable alternative to other representations. And in fact, I hope that the sieve will be included along with scales and pitch classes and set classes as one of the fundamental ways for describing pitch collections. Um, my portable and easy to use implementation is available and I hope maybe some of you will find it useful to use um, in the future. Thank you.